right. And if you don't do the research that I and others have done, you will never know anything about them. I can guarantee you that. They meet in secret. They take oaths that they will be submit to ritual murder if they betray those oaths. They have infiltrated every level of society, the military, and the government <coughs> in all of the major nations, the important nations of the world, and most of the smaller nations. And they are, at this moment, I can assure you, in total control of everything. They are propelling the world into what they call a new world order. What they hope will be a utopia on earth for them, with us relegated to the position of mere slaves, much as the people were relegated to their positions in George Orwell's book, 1984. George Orwell was a member of British intelligence and knew what he was writing about. For I first got my glimpse into this plan when I was a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence. And British intelligence and the intelligence agencies of the United States of America are both working closely together to bring this about. And I will prove that to you tonight. I found it intriguing in my research that in most, if not all, primitive societies, all of the adults are members. They are usually separated into male and female groups. The male usually dominates the culture. Surprisingly, this exactly resembles many civilized secret societies in which they profess to want to give women rights, but in actual practice, they never, ever do. This could only mean that the society is working not against established authority, but is the established authority. In fact, this would tend to remove any validity of any argument that all secret associations are dedicated to the destruction of properly constituted authority. How can they be if they are it? This can only apply, of course, when the secret society makes up the majority or entirety of any people which it affects. Only a very few fall into this category. For those of us here, except for maybe one or two members of these secret societies who have come to see how much we really know, and how much of it we are really telling to you, we're left out of this cycle. The actual religion is as old as man, and it began on the first sunrise when the first man opened his eyes on this earth and saw the sun rise up and spread warmth across his body. And he could see, and he could act, and he could run from the wild animals because he could see them far away. He could take care not to step into danger. But then something happened. The sun went down and sank and died. And man was then confronted with the forces of darkness. And man learned that the forces of darkness are not secure. That the beast can sneak up on him in the dark and eat him. That there is no warmth, that he must seek cover or shelter in order to survive. The next morning, however, man was surprised to see the sun was resurrected. It arose from the dead and again traveled across the heavens. It passed over and then died again. And this became the first religion worship of the sun. It was the first king who died to be resurrected to save his people. Now, to the priests of this religion who came later, this was all symbolism for the power of the God of the universe. The sun was the symbol of the God. And the god was called Baal, or Baal, spelled B-A-A-L. The oldest name amongst the people for this order was the Brotherhood of the Snake, also called the Brotherhood of the Dragon. And it still exists under many different names and many different occupations, some seemingly opposing the others. 
but they're all the same. They control people with the Hegelian philosophy of political conflict resolution thesis, <coughs> thesis, synthesis. They find the synthesis first, what they want, and then they create the two forces that oppose each other that they know beforehand will create and bring about the synthesis. People think it all happened by accident. The Brotherhood of the Snake is devoted to guarding the secrets of the ages. They concealed the truth from the people and have been hoarding and guarding secret technology since the beginning of men. And they are devoted to the recognition of Lucifer as the one and only true God. Now let me make something clear here. They don't really believe that Lucifer is God. They deal in symbology. And they heap layers of symbology upon symbology, so it is difficult to penetrate to the truth. Lucifer is the symbol of the Luciferic philosophy, which is this. Man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust and vindictive God, and he was set free from the bonds of ignorance by Satan <coughs> on the orders of Lucifer. Some say they're the, they're the same. Doesn't matter what you believe, this is their story. I'm going to tell it the way they believe it. But they set man free with the gift of intellect, and through the use of the gift of intellect, man himself will become God. Lucifer is the symbol of the intellect, the brain, back from it. That's what the Templars truly worshipped. They didn't worship the skull. The skull was the symbol, the receptacle of the brain, the intellect. It is pure humanism. They were also the first communists. The communists came from them. And our enemy was never communism. Our enemy has always been the brotherhood of the state. It is clear, ladies and gentlemen, that religion has always played a significant role in the course of these organizations and in human events throughout history. Whether or not you personally are religious makes no difference whatsoever. What religion you believe in also makes no difference whatsoever. If they have the power and they believe this story, or this philosophy, it will affect you no matter what you believe, no matter who you are, no matter where you live. That is the reality of the world. The quicker we understand that, the better off we will be. Communication with a higher source, often divine, is a familiar claim at all but a few of these organizations. The secrets of these groups are thought to be so profound that only a chosen, well-educated few are able to understand and use them. These men use their special knowledge for the benefit of all mankind, and that's their rationalization or the terrible things that they perform in order to reach the end. And they believe that the end always justifies the means. How are we to know what their end is? Well, throughout history, it's been kept secret. But they are so confident in attaining their goal now that anyone can find out. They're not even hiding it anymore. Indeed, it cannot even be said to be a conspiracy, for the definition of a conspiracy is two or more people who meet in secret to plan or do something which they know is illegal. They don't hide it any longer. Give me a pause in a few minutes and wet my mouth because I have a sinus condition and the medicine I take dries everything up. Secret societies, folks, mirror events in everyday life. There's always an exclusivity of membership, and this is one of their holding forces to get you to want to join, to get you to want to stay and preserve the secret. With the result of importance attached to being or becoming a member, 
And this is found in all human endeavors, even those which are not secret, such as football teams or country clubs or your little clique on your block or in your pub or whatever it is that you belong to. It's a human failing that we want to belong sometimes so much, we want to be loved so much that we give up what we should do in order to attain it. Because of this, most of the members of this exclusive secret society are insecure people. Insecure. Lacking in affection and love. And even when they find out the truth about the organization, which they don't know for a long time, they sometimes rationalize staying with it to fulfill the need to be loved. So that they will not be rejected by the friends and the brothers and sisters that they've made during the years that they've spent in this organization that has become to mean so much to them. There's the use of signs, passwords, and other tools. They deal in symbology. They flaunt the truth in front of your nose all the time, but since you cannot read their language, you interpret it in another way. And I'll show you a good example of that in one of the videotapes in just a few moments. I'll also show you that on the great seal of the United States. The United States of America was founded by our forefathers to create the new world order. The stated reason almost always, different from the real reason for the society's existence, is important. It can be anything, but it's usually fraternal, and it's found in all pressure groups wherever people congregate. And if you ask what the purpose is, it's a fraternal organization existing for the good of the community. Why do they take oaths that say that they talk about what happens during their meetings and the secrets of the lodge? That they will be slit from their throat to their stomach, or across their throat, or across their stomach, depending upon which oath and which degree they belong to. The comradeship is especially important, and notice the word comradeship. One of their bywords is comrade, our fellow traveler. And one of the ways that they can find out if you're a member or not, they ask you, have you traveled to the east? Are you a traveler? Are you a fellow traveler? Your answer will tell them whether or not you are a member. Now, you have to understand that not only were those the passwords and bywords and secret codes of this secret organization, but they were also used by the Communist Party, which is just another branch of the same organization, along with a religion that you just looked at, and another one called Mormonism. Sharing hardships or secrets has always been a special thrill to man. No one who has ever undergone the rigors of boot camp and military service is ever likely to forget the special feeling of belonging and comradeship that was shared between the victims of the drill sergeant or company commander. Is that correct? It is with me. For it's a traumatic experience. You are caused to die and be reborn, and that is what the process of initiation is all about. They destroy your previous life, your previous personality. They destroy everything that you've ever been taught in your life. They shave your head off. They make you all look alike, and you are reborn as a soldier in this unit, and your attachment to that unit never leaves you for the rest of your life. And it is brainwashing. It is the most basic form of brainwashing that there is. And all branches of the secret society requires that you be born again. You must suffer a ritual death to be born again. George Bush is a member of the Skull and Bones, which is a branch of the secret society. A ritual death lying naked in a coffin crypt at Yale University with a ribbon tied around his genitals signifying the amputation, the raising of man above the animal to the state of pure intellect. And in the ancient days when you reached the sixth degree,
agreed this operation was actually performed. That's why you read in these books the Arthurian legends and the legends of the ancient Egyptians. There's always this account of a profession of procession of women holding a shallow ditch. One of them is carrying a spear dripping blood, and there's a reed. The reed was placed in the urethra, so that when the member was amputated, urination could still be performed until the wound healed, and the urethra would not be sealed in the healing. The most potent tool of any secret society, folks, is the ritual and myths surrounding initiation. And I use the example of boot camp in the military because most of us understand what that is, whether we went through it or not. We've been exposed to it, either movies or television, or from your father or an uncle or brother, and even many of the women in here have probably served your country in one of the ranches of the military service. So you should be able to look back upon that experience and understand now better what happened to you. These special binding ceremonies have very deep meaning for all participants. Initiation performs several functions which make up the heart and soul of any true secret society. Like boot camp, the initiation into the armed forces of important aspects of human thought that are universally compelling are merged to train and maintain the efforts of a group of people to operate in a certain direction. Initiation bonds the members together in mysticism, and that's how they corrupt the next generation into going along with the generation that preceded them. Or to open your mouth is to give up your standing in the community. Neophytes gain knowledge of a secret, giving them special status. The ancient meaning of neophyte is planted anew or reborn. A higher initiation is in reality a promotion inspiring loyalty and the desire to move up to the next rung and learn more. The goals of the society are reinforced, causing the initiated to act toward those goals in everyday life. That brings about a change in the political and social action of the member. And without even realizing the goal of the society, they are soon working to bring about the end, the completion of the ancient plan or the great work. The change is always in the best interest of the goals of the leaders of the secret society. The leaders are called adepts. This can best be illustrated by the soldier trained to follow orders without thinking. The result is often the wounding or death of the soldier for the realization of the commander's goal, which may or may not be good for the overall community. Initiation is a means of rewarding ambitious men who can be trusted. We'll notice that the higher the degree of initiation, the fewer the members who possess the degree. These organizations consist always of a pyramidal structure of membership. With a whole bunch of stupid, slathering idiots down here thirsting after the secrets that they will never know, and a few adepts at the top controlling them all. Why would anyone ever join a society that they know nothing about and are told from the beginning that they will never know anything about until they go through years of degrees of initiation? And we wonder how we can be manipulated so easily. Humanity, unfortunately, is flawed. We all battle daily within us to do the right thing and the wrong thing. Often, the wrong remains out. Also, unfortunately. This is not because the other members are not ambitious, but because a process of very, very careful selection is being conducted. A point is reached where no effort is good enough without a pull up by the higher members. Most members never proceed beyond this point and never learn the real secret purpose of the group. 
The frozen member from that point on serves only as a part of the political power base, as indeed he has always done. You may have guessed by now that initiation is a way to determine who can and cannot be trusted, and who will be moved up to take part in the manipulation of the world. There are many methods of deciding that, I'm going to skip over those, simply because they're not very that important. One of the mysteries is that religion, in most instances, but not all, is but a tool to control the masses. Knowledge or wisdom is their only God. Lucifer is the symbol of that God. The sun is also the symbol of God. So is Osiris, Ra, the light. And since some people say that Lucifer is also Satan, they may be satanic, however, I have not been able to prove or disprove that statement. I will back in the pyramid, and whenever you see that eye in the pyramid, you are looking at an organization that belongs to the secret group. Whether you call it the Masonry or the Ancient Order of the Rose and Cross or the Knights Templar or the Sovereign Military Order of the Knights of Malta or the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, makes no difference. They are all the same. Another symbol is the beehive. Another symbol is the circle with the dot in the middle. There are many more. But the pyramid with the all-seeing eye is the most prevalent, the one that you will see probably most often. Undesirable effects of secret societies and their aura of mystery has sometimes given them the reputation for being abnormal associations, or at the very least, strange groups of people. Whenever their beliefs are those of the majority, they are no longer considered antisocial. A good example is the Christian Church, which at one time was a secret society under the Roman Empire. In fact, the, quote, open, friendly, secret society, unquote, which is now the Vatican, actually ruled most, if not all, of the world at one time. Since the beginning of recorded history, governmental bodies of every nation have been involved in maintaining the status quo to defend the establishment against minority groups that sought to function as states within states or to oust the constituted authority and take over in its place. In effect, they become governments within governments, failed and hidden, but always the power behind the throne. Many of these attempts have succeeded, but have not always lasted. Man's desire to be one of the elect is something that no power on earth has been able to lessen, let it alone destroy. And that is one of their greatest powers. It is one of the secrets of secret societies. It is what gives them a political base and lots and lots of clout. Members often vote the same and give each other preference in daily business, legal, and social activities. It is the deepest desire of many to be able to say, I belong to the elect. I am one of the chosen few. I know secrets that you do not know. I am one of the masters. Houses of worship and sacrifice existed all throughout the ancient world. They were in fact temples built in honor of the many gods, and these gods were there for the people. The priests knew the true esoteric knowledge and gave the people the exoteric or the common interpretation. Esoteric means secret or hidden, and the people were never given it. These buildings functioned often as meeting places for philosophers and mystics who were believed to possess the secrets of nature. These men usually banded together in seclusive philosophic and religious schools and were known as the mysteries. The most important of all these ancient groups is the Brotherhood of the Snake or Dragon, simply known collectively as the mysteries. The snake and dragon are symbols that represent wisdom. The father of wisdom is Lucifer, also called a light bearer. And 
this is where the deception begins to come in because Christ said that he was the light. That's why so many people get confused. I am of the light, therefore I cannot be wrong. Which light? Which light are you with? And who taught you about that light? And what does it mean? Because I can guarantee you, most of us only see the exoteric interpretation, not the real meaning. And many people are following the darkness, believing that they are with the light. The focus of worship for the mysteries was the sun, also known as Baal or Osiris, Ra, the light, or Lucifer. Lucifer was the angel of light. He was the smartest angel in heaven. He had the most knowledge. He rebelled against God. He was flung down to the earth to be the master of the world. The legend of the mystery schools is that a star vanished from the sky. It was called the morning star. The morning star of the Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning star? That was the first UFO sighting in the history of the world. The sun is the representation of their God. Osiris was represented by the sun. That's a quote from Albert Pike. How art thou fallen from Lucifer, O? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Isaiah 14, verse 12. It is claimed that after Lucifer fell from heaven, he brought with him the power of thinking as a gift for mankind. Quote from Fred Giddings from his book Symbolism in Occult Art. Most of the greatest minds that ever lived on this earth were initiated into the Society of Mysteries by secret and sometimes dangerous rites, some of which were very cruel. Some of the most famous were known as Osiris, Isis, Sabius, Sybil, Eleusis, and Baal. Plato was one of those initiates, and he describes some of the mysteries and his own initiation in his writings. Plato's initiation encompassed three days of entombment in the Great Pyramid, during which time he died symbolically, was reborn, and was given secrets that he was to preserve. Plato's writings are full of information on the mysteries. Manly P. Hall, 33rd degree Mason, stated in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, that, quote, the Illumined of Antiquity entered its portals as men, they came forth as gods, unquote. The ancient Egyptian word for pyramid was kuti, which meant glorious light. Mr. Hall also says, quote, the pyramids, the great Egyptian temples of initiation, unquote. The pyramids, ladies and gentlemen, were never tombs. They were the temples of initiation, of the worship of Lucifer. According to many, the Great Pyramids were built to commemorate and observe a supernova explosion that occurred in the year 4000 BC. Dr. Anthony Hewish, 1974 Nobel Prize winner in physics, discovered a rhythmic series of radio pulses which he proved were emissions from a star that had exploded around 4000 BC. And listen to this. The Freemasons begin their calendar from AL, which is in the year of light, Anos found by adding 4,000 to the modern year. That's 1990 plus 4,000 equals 5,598 <coughs> You can find these dates on the cornerstones of buildings where the cornerstone was laid with a Masonic ceremony. You will find them on most buildings in Great Britain. George Mikanowski wrote in The Once and Future Star, that the ancient Sumerian cuneiform described a giant star exploding within a triangle formed by Zeta Pupae, Gamma Valorum, and Lambda Valorum, located in the southern sky. And the same tablets state that the blazing
same star that had exploded within the triangle would again be seen by man in 6,000 years. And according to the Freemason's calendar, it will occur in what year? The year 2000. That's why we know, because their calendar ends at the date 6,000, that the completion of the great work is scheduled for the year 2000. That gives us a little less than eight years, folks, to do something about this, or join them. And here's some more of their beliefs, and I'm quoting. The first one, I always quote them, so that nobody can ever accuse me of bringing false charges against this group. I tell you what they believe, I'm quoting them. The first man who bethought himself of saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the real founder of civil society. What crimes, what wars, what murders, what miseries and horrors would he have spared the human race if someone would have warned? Beware of listening to this imposter. You are lost if you forget that the fruits of the earth belong to all and the earth to no one. That's communism. Ownership of property is not peculiar to the human race. The bird has its nest. The dog has its bone that it will savagely defend. If everything were divided up today, all would be unequal again tomorrow. One man would fritter away his share. Another would double it by turning it to good account. The practical and energetic would soon be more prosperous than the idler or the wastrel. The parable of the ten talents perfectly illustrates the difficult capacity of differing men to deal with money. And that is why we must rule with a benevolent despotism. This is the precise language of internationalists today, and it is of course easy to point out the evils of exaggerated patriotism. But it will not be found that the man who loves his country is less able to respect foreign patriots any more than that the man who loves his family is a worse neighbor than one who cares little for his wife and children. That's a quote of Nesta Webster. It was not one of them. The Bible tells us, and the laws of nature tell us, that he who dribbles away his money does not deserve it. He who beats his wife does not deserve a wife. It is to the fittest. It is to the one who earns, who does honest labor, to reap the reward. Why should one labor to feed all? For in those kinds of societies, that's exactly what happened. Look what happened in communism, Russia, the Soviet Union. One of the most frequently quoted sayings of the people in the Soviet Union was, We pretend to work, and they pretend to pay us. So I can safely tell you, with no psychic powers whatsoever, that the New World Order will be totalitarian and socialist in nature. Here are their tenets. Abolition of monarchies and all ordered government, except for theirs. Abolition of all private property and inheritances. Abolition of patriotism and nationalism. Abolition of family life and the institution of marriage and the establishment of communal education of children, abolition of all religion. And if you look around you in the world today, that is exactly what is taking place, folks. Exactly. They are building their world under our noses. And because they are generally right when they call us cattle and don't use their brains, Unfortunately, they're getting away with it.
Cecil Rhodes, British subject, was a great friend of Albert Pike's, the man who established the control of the Illuminati in the United States for its evil intent. He's also a good friend of Giuseppe Mazzini, who was the head of the Illuminati in Europe. They corresponded frequently. The letters between Pike and Rhodes and Mazzini used to be on display in the British Museum, and good researchers still may be able to dig them out, and they haven't buried them forever. And one of the things that Cecil Rhodes wanted to do was leave money in his will for the secret society that would bring about the New World Order. But he changed that will, realizing that he left the money in the will, and it would become public knowledge that there was going to be a New World Order, so he couldn't do that, could he? The study led his fortune to Lord Rothschild to establish the things that Cecil Rhodes wanted. He wanted bright young men chosen to be trained in England to become the leaders of the New World Order. So the election that just occurred in the United States of America was no victory for us, for Bill Clinton was a Rhodes scholar. He's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and he's a Mason. So we just lost all the way around. All the way around. In my country, the United States of America, of a total of 1,372 American Rhodes Scholars up to 1953, and that's as far up as we're able to get it because we can't identify the positions that they all hold now, 431 held or hold positions in teachings, Educational administration, among them are 31 college presidents, 113 held government positions, 70 held positions in press and radio, and 14 were executives in foundation. Here's what Adam Weisop said. In reference to the various governmental leaders which the Illuminati had targeted for subversion, Weishaupt remarked, quote, It is therefore our duty to surround them with the Illuminati's members so that the profane may have no access to them. Thus we are able most powerfully to promote our interests. If any person is more disposed to listen to princes than to the order, he is not fit for it and must rise no higher. We must do our utmost to procure the advancement of Illuminati into all important civil offices. By this plan we shall direct all mankind. In this manner, by the simplest means, we shall set all in motion and in flames. The occupations must be so allotted and contrived that we may in secret influence all political transactions. That's why Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, Nothing ever happens by accident. Everything is planned. On the 16th of July in 1782, they had a, oh, a secret Congress. Nesta Webster observes, quote, What passed at this terrible Congress will never be known to the outside world, for even those men who had been drawn unwittingly into the movement and now heard for the first time the real designs of the leaders were under oath to reveal nothing. One such honest Freemason, the Comte de Berry, a member of the Martinique Lodge at Lyons, returning from the Congress de Willemsbad, could not conceal his alarm. And when questioned on the tragic secrets he had brought back with him, replied, quote, I will not confide them to you. I can only tell you that all this is very much more serious than you think. The conspiracy which is being woven is so well thought out that it will be, so to speak, impossible for the monarchy and the church to escape from it. From this time onwards, says his biographer, in Costa de Beauregard, the Comte de Peru could only speak of Freemasonry with horror. Unquote. Shortly after that, a messenger writing from the Bavarian Lodge to another lodge in Germany struck by lightning and was killed. Fell off his horse. The people ran up and found him carrying a pouch with papers in it which they gave to the Bavarian government. They were examined. 
exact paragraphs out of what is now known as the Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion, which has been blamed upon the Jews, and the Jews did not write it. The point that I made very well in my book. You see, folks, in the world order, all existing religions will be destroyed, including Judaism. All of you who are persecuting the Jews, thinking that they're the cause of all of our ills, are falling exactly right into the hands of those who would enslave us. For that is how they manipulate us, and that's how they destroy us, by getting us fighting against each other in the United States, blacks against whites. I never met a black man or a woman who ever sat around their kitchen table and thought seriously about coming to kill me. And I never knew any white person in the United States who ever did the same thing. Yet constantly, social pressures are put upon us to battle with each other. And if you trace these social pressures, they always lead to the same place, the lodges of Freemasonry, which to this day are segregated. They have black lodges, but they're all black members. They have Jewish lodges, but they're all Jewish members. Yes, they do. It's known as the Order of the Eastern Star. The Eastern Star, the Morning Star, that's Lucifer. You'll have to ask Margaret. I live in the United States. <laughs> Let's hold our questions till the end, folks. I've got a lot of ground to cover. I realize that this is upsetting. I realize that some of you have family members who belong to this organization. I realize that some of you are hearing this for the first time and don't really understand what the hell it is you're hearing. But please be patient. The Council on Foreign Relations Handbook of 1936 provides the following details concerning the organization's establishment by Freemasons on May the 30th, 1919. Several leading members of the delegations to the Paris Peace Conference met at the Hotel Majestic, and that's where Operation Majestic 12 comes from, the deception that is trying to convince you that aliens are here, in Paris to discuss setting up an international group which would advise their respective governments on international affairs. The U.S. was represented by General Tasker H. Bliss, Chief of Staff, United States Army, Colonel Edward M. House, Whitney H. Shepherdson, Dr. James T. Shotwell, and Professor Archibald Coolidge. Great Britain was unofficially represented by Lord Robert Cecil, Lionel Curtis, Lord Eustace Percy, and Harold Timberley. It was decided at this meeting to call the proposed organization the Institute of International Affairs. Percy eventually became Pierce in the United States. George Bush is a member of that family, as is his wife. At a meeting on June 5th, 1919, the planners decided it would be best to have separate organizations cooperating with each other. Consequently, they organized the Council on Foreign Relations with headquarters in New York and a sister organization, the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London, also known as the Chatham House Study Group, to advise the British government, a subsidiary organization, the Institute of Pacific Relations, was set up to deal exclusively with Far Eastern affairs. Other organizations were set up in Paris and Hamburg, the Hamburg branch being called the Institute for Osmotic Politics and the Paris branch being known as the Centre d'Etudes de Politique at Rangier. I'm not good at French, so I hope you understand <coughs> Baron Edmund de Rothschild of France dominated the Paris Peace Conference, and each of the founders of the Royal Institute ended up being men who met Rothschild's approval. The same was true of the Council on Foreign Relations, which was not officially formed until 29 July 1921. When he came from J.P. Morgan, Bernard Baruch, Otto Kahn, Jacob Schiff, Paul Warburg, and John D. Rockefeller, amongst others. And this was the same crowd involved in the forming of the Federal Reserve, the Council's original board of directors, including.
included Isaiah Bowman, Archibald Cooley, John W. Davis, Norman H. Davis, Stephen Dugan, Otto Kahn, William Shepard, Whitney Shepardson, and Paul Horberg in the center of power was with the Knights of the Golden Circle in Cincinnati. I do most of my research, ladies and gentlemen, through genealogy because I have found that they pass their membership in these organizations down from father to son and they intermarry to keep the power within great families. This is called an oligarchy. Now, one of the great initiation rites of Freemasonry is the story of Hiram of Bill. And the story goes that the Master Mason building the Temple of Solomon, which is all allegory. It doesn't mean anything about the real Temple of Solomon. They deal in symbols. The Temple of Solomon is the Temple of the Sun. The Knights of the Temple are the Temple Builders. The Temple is the body of man which they strive to make perfect. And when man has reached the perfect state, he will be known by the number 666. That's what all this New Age Godly movement is all about. It took me years to discover this. I thought I was never going to do it. But I finally did. It made me so happy. <laughs> I'm a bit, the master mason of the temple, was killed by three fellow crap member. He was struck in the back, in the throat, and in the head. This symbolized, folks, not a real murder that actually took place in history. That's for you to think. It symbolizes the oppression of the order, the religion of Baal, by the state, by the church, and by the mob. And they are sworn to avenge the death of Hiram of Biff by destroying the state, the church, and shackle the mob. And who do you suppose the mob is? It's you and I. They want to enslave us forever. And if we're not very careful, they are going to do it. You hear all this talk of Isis and Osiris and the Earth Mother. And nobody really knows what that means. Also, some people profess, profess that they do. And when you think that you do, you are holding with your teeth to the butt of the exoteric joke. I'm going to give you the true meaning now. The fable of Isis and Osiris, as it has descended to us in the account given by Plutarch, has not been greatly amplified by modern research. The Egyptian fragments, which have been translated in recent years, offer no complete account of the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Osiris, who was really who. I'm going to give you the account of the rule and death of Nimrod. Because Nimrod was Osiris. Well, Nimrod was the first priest in the cult of the worship of Baal. The story of the life and death of Osiris is the story of the life and death of Nimrod, who represented their god, Lucifer. The ancient Babylonians, Nimrod was the light, the chief priest. He was the one who created the religion in the first place, built the city. He taught the men how to make war, go kill animals. According to legend, his wife taught the women how to plant and harvest crops. This is what is meant by the gift of intellect, knowledge to man. Everybody follow me, I hope? If you get lost in this, heaven help us all. Because it's complicated. <coughs> anyway, I'm going to go over it quickly. Osiris was a great king in legend. Everybody thinks this is Egyptian, but it's Babylonian. He's a great king. He 
taught the men how to hunt, how to build walled cities to protect themselves from enemies and from wild beasts. His wife, Isis, in the old religion, was a star. Taught the women how to sow and reap the harvest. The people loved Osiris, but he had a jealous brother, Python, also known as Set, who conspired to kill Osiris by building a coffin out of wood and said that anyone, it was a beautiful box actually, it wasn't a coffin, it was beautiful, according to the legend, the most beautiful box ever built. According to the legend, at one dinner and party one night, Python set this box in the middle of the road in the room and said, anyone who can lie perfectly and fit in this box perfectly can have it. And everyone tried, but he had built it to the exact length of height of Osiris. Osiris laid the box and fit. Quickly, being his henchman, grabbed the top of the box, put it on, nailed it down, and poured molten lead around the scene. They then took it out and buried it under a tree. This morning, you heard about the forest when we used to fall. It's just the same story. That's why the tree, the forest, is so important to these people. Well, Cyrus coming home and not finding her husband and brother, set out to find him. She found him and brought him back to the castle. And by magic, was trying to bring him back to life. When Titan found out that she found the coffin, they snatched the body, chopped it into 14 pieces, and scattered it over the land. Isis, in a fit of rage, flew out to find the pieces. She found all save one. She found all the pieces except for the penis of Osiris, which is also known as the lost word of Freemasonry, or the generative force, the G in the middle of the star, denoting generation. And so, she made a substitute. Some stories say out of wood, some say out of gold. But the religion in their altars always had a gold penis, which in later years became an obelisk. <coughs> the obelisk is the penis of Osiris. It's the symbol of the presence of Lucifer. It's the lost word of Freemasonry. It's all of those things. Isis, in her sorrow, changed into a hawk and covered above the body in a magical ceremony and became present, pregnant with a child, of course. Now I'll interpret all of this for you, folks. Osiris, the black god of the Nile, must be guarded as the personification of an order of learning. For Plutarch, identifies him beyond question with the holy doctrine or the mystery tradition as thought personifies the whole sphere of knowledge and it was through his assistance that Osiris came into being. So Osiris embodies the secret and sacred wisdom reserved for those who were proficient in the ancient rites. It's important to understand that. Unquestionably, Osiris was later confused with other members of that vast pantheon of divinities which developed in the decadent period of Egyptian religious culture, but to the elect he represented to the end primordial knowing the gift of intellect to man by Lucifer through his agent, Satan. That utter realization of truth, undefiled by intellection, unlimited by any mortal procedure, uncircumscribed by the limitation of thinking. He signified not only that divine at one moment with the absolute, which is the end of all illumination, but by his life, death, and resurrection revealed the means by which mortal consciousness could achieve that end. And Osiris was symbolized also by the sun, which died in the evening, was resurrected the following morning. Thus Osiris becomes a dual symbol, being in the first place the esoteric wisdom itself, or the hidden wisdom, and in the second place the composite order of initiates through whom that tradition was perpetuated. 
The personality of Osiris thus typifies the institution erected by the ancients to perpetuate the deathless truths of the soul. The living head was crowned with the plumes of wisdom and power. The hands bore the scepters of the three worlds, but the body was bound with the mummy wrappings of the dead, signifying that the soul was trapped in the body, in the material world. Here we find spirit, the living head, bound incongruously to matter, the mummified body. The soul was imprisoned in the narrow bonds of flesh. One thing is certain, Osiris represented the secret doctrine doctrine prior to that time when the omnific word was lost. Osiris is the first of the five children of death. He therefore corresponds with the first of five divine kings of China and the five exoterically known Diana Buddhas of Lamaism. The five children of Nut are the five continents which have appeared upon the earth and the five races which have populated these continents. Osiris is the primitive revelation of the first race, but as Isis was born upon the fourth day, we find this tradition coming into Egypt through the Atlantean mystery school of which Isis is the symbol, and remember Hitler and his generals believed in Atlantis also. They all belong to the same club, folks. And at the highest level of every country, they all belong to the same club, except your ruling family here, which because of the Queen Mother has refused to join. Because of that, we're going to see the monarch fall. That is what is happening now. From the reign of Osiris, we glean the following philosophical thing. There was a time, the golden age, when truth and wisdom ruled the earth. And this aristocracy of wisdom was a benevolent despotism, or dictatorship, folks. I mean, to try to make it sound good, but a dictator's a dictator. I don't care what you put in front of his name. In which men were led to a noble state of being by the firm, kindly hand of the enlightened sage. Well, go back and read about ancient Babylon. You'll find that the king did not have any kind of a kindly hand, but firm it was. Often firmly enclosing the handle of the sword to the use of which heads rolled. This was the divine dynasty of the mythological priest kings who were qualified to govern humanity by virtue not only temporal, but by divine attributes. And there is a bloodline that has been guarded jealously by these people for centuries. It is the line of those who throughout history have claimed and have been given the divine right to rule. The symbol of this bloodline is called Jacob's Pillar, which is the stone under the coronation throne of England. <laughs> Through his priest, Osiris, representative of the hidden tradition, ruled the entire world by virtue of the perfection resident in that tradition. If we can see that Osiris is the positive pole of the universal life agent, then Isis becomes the receptive pole of that activity. And that is the meaning of the star David, the androgynous god, the male and female in one body. For the triangle is the symbol of the male, and the delta is the symbol of the female. If you look at them with an open mind, they resemble the actual genitals of the two sexes. In other words, folks, Osiris is the doctrine, Isis is the church. Forget all this earth mother bullshit. As in Christianity, it is customary to refer to the church as the bride of Christ. So in Egypt, the institution of the mysteries was the great mother, the consort of heaven itself. From this interpretation, we gain a deeper insight into the symbolism of the whole Osirian cycle. Isis becomes the temporal order of the priesthood, the accumulative body of initiates. She is personified as the temple. She is the mother of all good, the protectress of all right, and the patron of all improvement. She ensures nobility inspires virtue and awakens the nobler passions of the soul. 
as Diana of Ephesus. She is the multi-mamia who feeds all creatures from herself, and that is the true meaning of the statue with about 13 breasts. It's not rude. It's the symbolism that Isis is the multi-mamia who feeds all creatures from herself. Now, I'm not saying I agree with any of this. I'm just telling you this is what it is. This is the truth. Without the truth, we can never be free. Like the moon, she shines only with the light of her sovereign sun, and that is the meaning of the sun and the moon in so many pictures and paintings that you see. It is the meaning of the crescent moon and the star. It is the meaning on the altar of Catholic churches of the both of Isis and the disc of Osiris. And you can see this everywhere. The sun and the moon are the symbols of Isis and Osiris, the mysteries. Like the moon, she shines only with the light of her sovereign sun, even as the temple can only be illumined by its indwelling truth. The temple is the body, remember? can only be illumined by its indwelling truth. Titan is the embodiment of every perversity. This is their belief. It is the negative creation, the Araman of Zoroasterism. It is black magic and sorcery, the black brotherhood, also called the Jesuits. Nephthys, his wife, is the institution through which he manifests. He is neither a single evil nor even a sequence of ills, but an infinite diversity of them, indescribably insidious, empowered to infect the fabric of church and state. Typhon lured Osiris into the ark of destruction at the time when the sun enters the house of the scorpion. Hence we know him to be the eternal betrayer, that ageless Judas, who undoes all good things and inevitably Sage is ruined. And according to the mysteries, Christ represents Osiris and Judas is Typhon in the mystery of the Christian religion. And once again, I'm saying I believe this, just telling you this is what they believe. And if they hold the power, it will affect us no matter what we believe. <coughs> Please understand that. He is the power of the physical universe which is constantly seeking to destroy the spiritual values locked within its substances. He strikes in the eighth month suppose that a child delivered in the eighth month of the prenatal epoch cannot live because of the curse of Titan. Osiris was born in the seventh month and that's why the United States Declaration of Independence was signed in July. I'll show you that later. All of our forefathers in the United States were Freemasons. Every member of the party who formed the Boston Tea Party and drew the tea in the Boston Harbor were Freemasons. Paul Revere was a Freemason. George Washington was a Freemason. Benjamin Franklin was a Freemason. Thomas Jefferson was a Freemason. Learned Jesuit father Susan Titan Cain and his brother Osiris Abel. See how they turned it around? Truth is, nobody knows who anybody is. They don't know either. You know how they can tell who is one of them? If you consent to be one of them and keep the secret, you are one of them. doesn't matter if you are a Jew, if you are black, if you are white, or what religion you belonged to before you joined. George Bush is a member. If such a parallel actually exists, then the biblical allegory is susceptible. Now, so you don't start getting antsy. This was written by a 33rd degree Freemason. Remember, I only use their words when I tell you what they mean. Type is the desire of the few pitted against the good of the many. Again, communism. He is the spirit of dissension and discord that breaks up unity of purpose by setting factions against each other so that great issues lose the name of action. And these are the people who really do that. The 
desire for riches, pomp, power, and sovereignty, which is what all American citizens possess, sovereignty, by which this evil genius was obsessed, reveals the temptation by which humanity is deflected from its ultimate goal and led into the byways of sorrow and despair. Typhus, the queen of Ethiopia, and the 72 conspirators represent the three destructive powers reserved to modern Freemasonry as the murderers of the master builder Iron Abyss, the church, the state, and the mob. Representing ignorant superstition and fear, the destroyers of all good things. The advent of greed and perversion marked the end of the golden age of the Osirian age. And when the good prince Osiris, the deeper truth, returned to his own land, he became the victim of a hideous plot. What is this mysterious chest, so beautiful in its outer appearance, but so fatal in its application? Plato, who was wise in the wisdom of the Egyptians, would have answered that it was the body that lures the soul into the sorrows of generation. If this interpretation be projected into the social sphere, the chest begun symbolic of material organization, Witness the application of this thought to Christianity, where the pomp and glory of the outer show a vast ecclesiastical decaying mechanism that has all but destroyed the simplicity and dignity of the primitive revelation of the mystery. Christians will not be allowed to live in the new world order. Neither will be the followers of Judaism, Islam, or any other religion. There will be a new religion, a humanist religion, where man will be God and religion will change with the needs of man. Christ will become a consciousness. And you will all worship this. Except for a few of us. We will be. from the invisible world, material facts were superseded by opinions. Opinions bred hatreds, and men finally fought and died over notions both senseless and soulless. What's wrong with their interpretation, folks, is that every investigation, the beginning of every war, and every theft, and every destruction of a nation and peoples that were living happily, lead you right to their door. Every time. But you see, this is written by a 33rd degree Freemason who then shows this to a new initiate who believes it. They're not told the truth until they reach the 30th degree. In the dark ages of uncertainty, when reality hid its face, and no man dared to know the leering Titan ruled his ill-gotten world, binding men to himself by breeding a thousand uncertainties to sap courage and weaken conviction. And in that, they're absolutely right. During the dark ages, the oppression of the Catholic Church was horrible. And anyone who whispered anything that disagreed with the utterances of the Pope were burned to the stake. Men ask, why seek to know? Knowledge does not exist. Life is a cruel jest, purposeless, and of short duration. Because the human mind demanded intellectual expression, time and sowed the seeds of intellectual confusion, so that numerous orders of learning appeared which were convincingly plausible but untrue. These various orders of thought survived by catering to the weaknesses and limitations of the flesh. Today our great industrial civilization is feeling the heavy hand of an outraged destiny. The evil genius of our ambitions has again undone us and our follies crumble about us. Titan rules the world, the earth today is the arena of the ambition, which is another lie. You see, because when you investigate who really rules the world, these men occupy the top positions in every country of the world. Remember, Satan is the great deceiver. What then of Isis, the mother of the mystery, she who was so defiled and desecrated by the profane that her sages and prophets were forced to flee into the wilderness to escape the machinations of the evil one? Is she not the woman clothed with the sun? Yeah. Of Revelation, who flees with her man-child into the wilderness to escape the evil purposes of the great dragon? That's what they believe. The glory of Egypt 
have ceased with the death of Osiris. The mighty temple still stood, but the God who illuminated them had gone. The priests bowed helplessly before the dead embers of their altars. One by one, the sanctuaries crumbled into ruin, and the custodians of these ancient truths hid themselves in obscure corners of the earth, lest they be hunted down and slain for the sin of dreaming and hoping for a better day. Isis then, as the scattered but still consecrated body of initiates, began the great search for the secret that was lost. In all parts of the world, the virtuous raised their hands to the heavens, pleading for the restoration of the reign of truth. Well, that can't be true, because none of them knew anything about anything or who they even were until they went up the ladder of initiation. This congregation of those who prayed and labored and waited, the great congregation of a world in anguish, this is Isis in sackcloth and ashes searching for the body of her Lord. Now, I can go on, but I think I'm going to stop right there because I've got a lot of
right wing of Count 33, the meritorious degree granted only to those who help the furtherance of the plan for completion of the great work. It's an honorary and meritorious degree. You'll see nine tail feathers representing the nine hidden supervisors. You see that also in the ancient order of the Rose of Cross, the nine founding members. The ascended master. Remember, they always claim communication with a higher order. In the last one, Talon, you will see 13 arrows, which denote aim, purpose, and necessary depth to those who oppose. In the right, an olive branch with 13 leaves and 13 olives, symbolizing that they are bearing fruit finally. And that they would rather do it peacefully by deception. For have you ever eaten the fruit of the olive tree? It doesn't taste good, folks, unless it goes through a long treatment. Above the head of the eagle, you will see a glory in which is the symbol of the androgynous god of the mystery schools, Lucifer. Now, this is not the symbol of the Jews. This is an ancient symbol. The Jews did not even adopt this symbol until the 17th century. It was not the seal of Solomon ever. Ever. You will see 13 stars, five pointed, representing the feminine, which make up a six pointed star representing the masculine. And they are together. You can also draw the male and the female parts, symbolizing positive and negative, good and evil, male and female. And around the outside, you can count 14 little puffs of clouds representing the 14 parts of Osiris that were chopped up and scattered over the land. On the reverse of the great seal, the first thing you'll notice at the top is annuit septus. According to the Freemasons and the dictionary and all of that stuff, annuit septus means he approves of our work. He who? Well, for them it's Lucifer. Everybody else has always thought it was God. But a more literal translation of this Latin, annuit septus, means announcing the birth of. And underneath it says, Novus Ordo Seclorum, which means literally translated, New Order of the Ages or New World Order. Secular is also used to mean worldly. Seclorum is intentionally spelled wrong so that exactly 39 letters come out, adding the letters in the bottom course of the pyramid, which make up the Roman numerals denoting 1776, also the year the Illuminati was founded in Bavaria by Adam Weikoff, who was a Jesuit. Why is that significant? Exactly 39 members of our forefathers signed the Constitution. There are exactly 39 core members of the Bilderberg group. It is the occult symbology, three times 13. The Trinity, three times. The order of the trapezoid. The pyramid, the pyramid, the pyramid, and the pyramids below the pyramid. Anybody who's in age movement has heard that, I guarantee you didn't know what it meant. You'll see behind the pyramid is a barren desert, meaning when they left Europe, they left persecution behind, and before the pyramid, you can see the growing green thing. Sown our seeds, and they are now going to grow. The pyramid has exactly 13 courses, and it's topped by the eye of Horus, the all seeing eye. The body of initiates represents the eyes of the whole, it's also the eye of Osiris, which means that you can't meet anywhere or do anything without one of them watching you. It's not the eye of God, it's the eye of men. It's a warning. Now, the order of the trapezoid is those who believe, and I'll put it the very easiest way that you will all understand it, for every action there's an equal but opposite reaction. It's the law of the universe, it's one of the first laws of physics, right? Everybody understand how that works? 
They believe that creation begins with a thought. And to become real material, really here, in action, thought, desire, action. The three legs of the pyramid is why the triangle is so important to the mystery. Thought, desire, action. The Trinity. That's start with Nimrod. The priesthood for the children. Osiris. Isis. Horus, the child. The body of initiative. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Throughout history, every religion has had a trinity at the top. Thought, desire, action is creation. This is what they believe. So, three times thirteen, folks, is the trinity. Death, and resurrection. And I knew that this was the key for years, but I didn't know how to work the formula. So I met a New Age guru who said I was telling me all about the positive and negative of the pyramid below the pyramid and how if the minute something is created, its opposite is created at the same time and the light bulb. That's the key. Because that's their philosophy in a nutshell. And if that's really true, because remember it's the androgynous God. Nothing can appear on this earth or in this universe that's positive without a negative. Word reaction is an equal but opposite reaction. If it didn't, nothing would work. And that's why I'm telling you right now, there will never be all good in the world. Lies in the face. One of the primary laws of the universe was Christ can come down here and work some magic, and I sincerely hope that he comes soon. <laughs> so, I knew that now, my trinity here had to have a pyramid below the pyramid, so I did it. And then I went back and studied my forefathers, because I knew this nation was created for a reason, and everybody's talked about it in my country since the inception of this country, the secret destiny of the United States of America. Everybody talks about it, nobody knows what it is. So I knew also that if all this other stuff was on the great seal, then the identity of our forefathers and what they were up to would also be on this great seal, and it is. On the bottom course of the pyramid are the Roman numerals 1776. I also discovered that Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson both were probably the two best astrologers that ever lived in their day. And it was them who calculated the exact date and time that the United States would be born by the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So I just merely took this and plugged it into the formula. The generative force is the male part, the penis of Osiris, the lost word of Freemasonry. So I have to do it with the top pyramid, the penis, the generative part. So all I did was plug this in. I didn't even change the order of the numerals at all. M. D. C, C, L, X, X, V, I. I just put them where they naturally belong, starting with the H <coughs> of the first triangle and moving right across in the exact order that they appear. So what have I got? Across the top, top I got MCX. That's 1,110. Being the researcher that I am, I quickly latched on to what that meant. That is when the fiery Sion founded itself upon the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and began its search for the relics of religion, Christianity, and the mystery. Everybody thinks the fiery Sion is a priory of the Catholic Church, and it is not. The priory of Sion quickly commissioned nine others to help them search the caves and the Temple Mount to find the relics. These men, 18 years later, became the first nine members of what is now known as the Knights Templar. So our forefathers were Knights Templars. And they founded this country for this reason, folks. We'll do the bottom line. DC is 600. LX is 60. EI is 6. 
United States of America was founded to bring in Christ in the world. <clears throat> now, I'd like to make it real for you, folks. I need the first video, please. <coughs> and the lights off on the stage. Folks, what I'm going to show you now is startling. It's the first time anybody in the world has ever seen it. Anybody. It's probably the most dangerous thing I've ever done, what I'm going to do now. Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas is on the 33rd parallel. It is in the shape of a pyramid, the eye being the underpass going under the railroad bridge. In Dealey Plaza are the four quarters of a Celtic temple and an obelisk dedicated to the location of the first Masonic Lodge in Texas. It is an outdoor pagan Masonic Temple of the Scottish Rite. The first and only Catholic president in a Freemason founded and controlled country. He was shot in the back and the throat and in the head, the exact same wounds suffered by Hiram Macbeth in the Masonic initiation. With one blow, the Scottish Rite and Freemasonry destroyed the political will of the American people struck a serious blow to the Catholic Church and crippled our country. And what you're going to see here is the first time that anyone has ever acknowledged that. They never show you what's in Dealey Plaza, and I didn't know myself until I went. And after all my research, I went to Dealey Plaza, and I was standing in the middle of a pagan temple Scottish Rite Freemasonry and tears came to my eyes. At the 33rd degree, right down the world. That's correct. If you look into history, you'll find that many, many famous assassinations have occurred on the 33rd degree. The 33rd parallel is a symbolic number of Freemasonry. It means the completion of the great work. Some not more step toward the completion of the great work. Okay, will you roll the tape, please? Could you uh, dim the house lights, please? Thank you. You can see Neely Plaza, your bliss, where Kennedy was shot, the sixth floor window is a perfect triangle. Also, where Oswald was shot is another triangle. You can see the four quarters of the Selfie Temple, which indicates the Scottish Rite. That's the, that's the uh, grassy knoll. We rented a helicopter and did a flyover. That's the grassy knoll there. That's the railroad yard behind. This is the corner of Maine and Houston. Kennedy came down Maine, turned right and went that way on Houston. They were supposed to go directly down Main Street through the center of the triangle, but the 33rd parallel is up on the hill. 33rd green 3 to 6, sixth floor window. And there's another combination of two threes which makes the third six. There's the 
be oblit, the penis of Osiris, crowned with a flame representing the light of Lucifer. It also represents knowledge, the intellect, primordial knowing.
but somebody was back there making noise like a gun. I don't know if it's firecrackers or bullets or blanks or what, <coughs> but whoever was behind that knoll making the noise was not the person who was to kill him or that killed him, as you will see. This is from the corner. The kinds of things. You know, they all show us the grass knoll and tell us there was a gunman up there, but they never take you behind the grass knoll with a camera to show you how impossible it is to kill a president from that position. But that's what they want us to believe, because we'll never get the real answer if we don't, or if we do. And remember, on the day Kennedy was shot, there was people all over there. All over there, just like them. Probably more people. Grass and old theory is a problem. We found these two storm drains. And the one on the right, there was no hole to look out of, so we looked out the one on the left. It's certainly a better position than grass and old. The one on the right would have been much better. And down below on the one on the right, both connected by a big culvert between the two, is a manhole cover that disappears into the sewage system. We know that some shots came from the front. And we don't even know if that's the place. We just know that the grassy knoll is an insane place where an assassin can intend to shoot someone if he wants to be successful. See, folks, there was no exit wound for the throat wound. No exit wound. <coughs> the doctors who probed the hole in the back said it only went in a half an inch and stopped, which means it was probably made later to fulfill the wound in the back, throat, and the head. They tried to disguise the throat wound by cutting a tracheotomy and scarring it all up. And it was never probed, but we know that the back wound never went anywhere. Now that's a perfect shot, whether it's from laying down and firing through the balustrade or from the top of one of the boxcars or the railroad tracks. But we still don't really know. And maybe we never will. And it's not important at all when you understand the organization was the Scottish Rite. They also found that the Ku Klux Klan and Kennedy was in the process of granting equal civil rights to blacks in America. Aside from the fact that he was Catholic, and he was striking at the bankers even more because he was printing United States notes non-interest demanding our marriage. That wasn't there in that day. If it hadn't been, maybe a whole restaurant would have seen and killed him. Look at the pyramid above that building. It's been erected since, but it's
that's a direct line in the center of the bridge and Elm Street. Which in the case of the pyramids, both very seldom ever an accident where they're placed. Just looking directly up Main Street, that's the route Kennedy should have traveled. That would have been a good position to fire at Kennedy on Elm Street. And so would the building to the left. Rise the driver. This is the real speed of the motorcade. On most films that you see, it's speeded up much faster than this. Watch the driver, folks. Don't look at Kennedy. Watch the driver. That's the place, that's the only break in the film. It's not missing frames, it's where the Bruder turned it off and then start, excuse me, started it again.
Jackie is not grabbing brains off the back of the car. There's nothing back there. Absolutely nothing. We put this on the computer, blown it up, examined it pixel by pixel. There's no wound to the back of Kennedy's head. We've examined it pixel by pixel. His hair is even messed up on the back of his head. He was hit by an exploding shell which blew the whole right front of his head up. Look at the car. Stop. Blocking the motorcade underneath the overpass, and it doesn't move until Kennedy's limousine almost runs into it. That was to make sure that he didn't escape without being thoroughly creamed. How many shots are you saying? Was it just one shot from the driver? Or was shots the shot? all over the place. You'll see. Just be patient, folks. Sorry. There's also a sound version. A sound. There's what appears to be a man in a hat holding a rifle in the bushes. Although I must tell you, it could be just the play of light and leaves. No one knows, there's no way to know, unless somebody wants to come forth and confess it. On the computer, we can't even tell. If anything, it looks more like the play of light and leaves than a real man with a rifle.
What could that something else be? It could be that this is easily debunked and draws your eye away. It could be that this is really a gun in William Greer's hand and he's really shooting the president because for this entire time he is looking directly at the president as if he's aiming a weapon. But if you look here, you'll see that there's an arm with something in it, something in the hand, coming across the back of the seat. Now this is not a reflection on Kellerman's head, it's above Kellerman's head. This is not a reflection. A reflection on a dark suit cannot ever be as bright as or brighter than reflections on grass, glass, and chrome, and this is, which indicates that the emulsion has been removed from the film. How do I know this? Because I have a degree in photography, and what you're seeing is a videotape made from an original first generation copy of the Zapruder film, which is in the vault of the intelligence community on 35 million. something going on with their hands in the front seat, like they're exchanging something. But you can't really tell, because it's all been scraped off. See, there's no little sunlight down there. Those aren't reflections. Yeah, watch right here, folks. Like the mini 
Shizuka. And you can see all the spray went up and back. And you can see that the whole right front of his head is laid open. And there is nothing on the back of his head. No head missing, no hair missing. The hair isn't even messed up. They've been feeding us nothing but love. And there you can see where they've doctored the film to hide a hand and something and an arm. See the cuff? Now here's Conley's arm right here. Now remember, you're seeing these frames for a long time. If we ran at the normal speed, you wouldn't even have time to, to notice anything in these frames. Nothing at all. Stop asking me how. I can't do everything for the whole world. It's your turn. 
the church. got to start to learn to put two and two together. Now, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm not insinuating anything, but you've got to learn to think. Seriously. The Secret Service just shot her husband. Who had her children? Where were her children? I don't know. See the back of the car, folks? The same things on the back of the car there that there was when he was shot. Now you'll see that that's definitely not a reflection on the top of Kellerman's head. We put it on a computer, we found his whole head, and we drew a line around it. And you're going to see it. And you'll be able to see also. You can also see flesh on Greer's face between what appears to be a gun barrel and the top of Kellerman's head. So the old argument that people say, Bill Cooper's crazy because that's a... Reflection on the top of Kellerman's head, don't hold water anymore. That's where Greer's shoulder really is by computer analysis. And you can see that they've scraped away his whole shoulder even up into the grass area so that you can't tell that he's turned that far around in the seat. That's the top of Kellerman's head. Now, if that's a reflection, that's the best Brill Cream job I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> there were witnesses who said they saw the driver turn and shoot Kennedy. They're dead. Okay, folks, I wish I could let you see the rest of this because there's a lot more important stuff on here, but time has run out. Um, you're the first people in the world who have seen this and now know this. Please do something about it. Please help us. Thank you. God bless you, and good night. <laughs> Can you get me the number, please? Um, we'd like to close up now. I uh, would like to apologise on the behalf of... Uh
secret because someday they will fly over all the major cities of the world. And our leaders will come on television and say, we finally made contact with an extraterrestrial race. They're here. And since they are more technologically advanced than us, they are a threat. And we must come together as one humanity to oppose that threat. Did you know that Ronald Reagan said six times in his presidency at the end of speeches? Wouldn't we all come together as one humanity and forget our petty differences if we were threatened from some other species from some other planet? Why would a president say that six times? Did you know that in a meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev, Ronald Reagan said that Premier Gorbachev and I have discussed the possible invasion from outer space of some other species from another planet, and we have agreed that if this were to happen, we would combine the military forces of the Soviet Union and the United States to face that threat. And then Mikhail Gorbachev walked to the microphone and said, I cannot foresee such a possibility, but if such a possibility occurs, we will gladly furnish our military might together with the military might of the United States to oppose an extraterrestrial invasion. Please start the film now. Ladies and gentlemen, after this film, I'd like you to take a 10 minute break. Please don't be gone longer than 10 minutes, and then we'll start again. Thank you very much. <laughs> Concerned about the ozone holes, the burning of the Amazon rainforest, global warming. Let me enlighten you. For these are all deceptions, manipulations designed to ask you to ask for more control. <coughs> Why is the Amazon rainforest burning? Anybody know? Nobody knows. You see, the first thing I ask when somebody tells me something terrible is happening, I think, why is this happening? Why is it burning? What caused it to burn? Who's behind it? What is the end result of the burning of the rainforest? Climate change. World Banker. Folks, let me tell you what happened down there. Brazil was going along, okay, and had too many poor people. Now, 98% of Brazil are dirt poor people at a poverty level that you cannot even imagine in this country, and we in the United States cannot imagine anyone being able to live under those conditions either, because we've never had to do it. So we don't understand that kind of poverty. They have unbelievable natural resources in Brazil, but they couldn't get at them. Nobody had the money to get at them and do anything with them. But they have the cheapest labor you could ever dream of. For these people would work for a scrap of bread. They're so poor that the children are considered to be a nuisance, and gunmen and thugs are hired by the businessmen to kill the children. That's the kind of poverty I'm talking about. The World Bank using money from the International Monetary Fund went to Brazil. Nobody asked them to go. Nobody asked them to do what they did. But what they did was build a road across the Amazon jungle going nowhere. Huge highway. Billions of dollars. For what? It didn't go anywhere. There were no cans. Nobody had any money to buy anything. The people are so poor. Well, these people knew that those poor people would see that road as the answer to their prayers, heaven on earth, Baal Hala, right over the horizon. <coughs> because now they had to wait to get to land which they never had before, couldn't afford to buy. And this was free. So they picked up their kids and their can of beans and they headed off down the road. When they came to a spot they liked, they began to cut the trees and burn the wood and plant crops so that they could feed themselves and get out of the dirt poverty that they've been living in for the rest of their lives. And the 
people who built that road knew that they would do it. And they knew that they would burn those trees. And they knew that the soil was so poor they could only grow one crop and would have to move on and chop more trees and burn them, for they had tested everything in advance. And they knew that the rest of the world, being stupid like we are, and being rich and used to having good things, would not understand what was happening and would say, we've got to stop burning the rainforest. But how can you tell a sovereign nation not to burn their own farms? Can't do that, can you? What's the answer? The answer is to make Brazil give up their sovereignty and thus make every nation give up their sovereignty so a world governing body can make sure that the rainforest doesn't burn. You see how easily we're manipulated? And when I said stupid, I mean it. Stupid means mentally crippled. And I don't mean to insult anyone, but before I can reach the point where I'm at now, I had to look in the mirror and say, Bill, you've been stupid for most of your life. Whether you like it or not, you have to admit it, you've been stupid for most of your life. Because you can't have a solution to a problem until you admit what the problem is. I was stupid, and that was the problem with me. Most of the people in the world are stupid, and that's their problem. Unless they can do what I did, look in the mirror and admit it, nothing is going to change. Ever. Ever. What is the truth about the ozone holes? Let me tell you. This is my newsletter for July 1st, 1992. The ozone layer and the so-called holes in the ozone layer are one of the biggest hoaxes in history. It is designed to hasten the new world order. The only answer to such a program were real and centralized control of the Earth's atmosphere and everything that goes into it. In other words, folks, one world government. The treaty signed at the Earth Summit, which made me puke every time I saw it on television in Brazil, were designed to nibble away at the sovereignty of nation states. I tuned into it one day on C-SPAN, and what did I see? I saw this huge wooden Dios, but it must have taken 40 trees to build this thing, and up on it were sitting in this order John Denver, the Dalai Lama, Whoopi Goldberg, and Al Gore, telling the rest of us that we shouldn't be using trees to build them. <laughs> Gag me with a spoon. Do you know that these so-called environmentalists were so concerned about the environment left behind five tons of paper trash on the ground? Did you read that in your newspapers? What a joke. Also, it does not stop all the violent radiation from reaching the Earth, folks. It is a product of the chemical reaction which does. And there's a simple test that you can all perform if you can get your hands upon an ultraviolet light. You will have instant illumination. It's a product, a byproduct of the chemical reaction that does shield us from the harmful rays. What really happens is that the sun produces light and many other forms of radiation, including the harmful ultraviolet spectrum. The atmosphere contains gases, mainly oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, trace gases, and other forms of some of these same gases. Take oxygen. The symbol is O, but it seldom exists as the same full atom O. That's an ion. Ions don't like to be alone. It seeks out another ion or another atom of oxygen. The two bond together and form O2, and that's what we breathe. You see, there are several forms of oxygen, as there are several forms of helium and many other chemical elements. A single atom of oxygen is known as an ion. Another form of oxygen, ozone, can also be found in small amounts in the atmosphere. Ozone, folks, is produced when large amounts of energy comes in contact with molecules of O2, causing the O2 to split into individual atoms or ions. Again, ions cannot exist long alone and seek each other out to form once again O2. Frequently, though, these ions will bond together quickly. If one can't find another individual ion, it will bond with one of the O2 molecules forming O3, which is ozone. Any simple high school textbook can explain this, and anyone can perform the experiments needed to prove it. Our three 
three atoms of oxygen, all those. Ozone floats in only a temporary state because the third atom is always seeking to depart. It's called a free radical and does so at the very first opportunity that is presented. This may be caused by another jolt of energy, such as lightning, which is the most common form, and that's why you smell ozone in the atmosphere after a thunderstorm. Or, it can be caused by coming into contact with something that will oxidize. Lightning, folks, is one of the most recognized means of converting O2 into iron. Ozone is constantly being formed, and destroyed every few seconds. The largest source of ozone comes from ultraviolet light entering the atmosphere and meeting large numbers of oxygen, or O2 molecules. The resulting chemical reaction depletes the ultraviolet light and splits the oxygen molecule into ions. These ions seek each other, are molecules of O2, and form either O2 or O3. The O3 does not exist more than a few seconds and reverts to O2 as the third atom is released to either unite again with another ion forming O2 or unites with another chemical which it oxidizes. As you can see, ozone is a byproduct of the process and has nothing whatsoever to do with protecting us from the ultraviolet light. You can prove this to yourself by getting an ultraviolet light. Gym stores, rock hound stores, people who collect rocks have ultraviolet lights because they use it as one method of identifying certain minerals. Take the ultraviolet light into a room, close the door, smell the air, you will not smell any ozone. Plug the ultraviolet light into the socket, shine it around in the room, and the room will instantly be filled with ozone and you will be able to smell it with your own nose. Ozone is created by ultraviolet light, and these people who convinced you otherwise are laughing at you. In fact, the whole universe is laughing. It's hilarious. That you blindly believe without investigation. And for most of my life, folks, don't feel so bad. I was guilty of the same thing until I looked in the mirror and said, Bill, you've been stupid most of your life. You're never going to be stupid again. And I hope you can find it in yourself to do the same thing. It's hard to do. It's hard to look at yourself in the mirror and say that you're stupid. It's hard to stand up here and admit to the world that I was stupid. But if I had not done that, if I had not identified the problem, I never, ever could have reached a solution. All this New Age movie about, don't talk about negative things. Don't talk to me about problems. I don't want to know about problems. It's terrible. Animals, including humans, folks, breathe air. We absorb the oxygen from our lungs into our bloodstream. The body burns this oxygen, creating carbon dioxide. We exhale this waste gas along with the inert gas. <coughs> Green plants, including plankton in the ocean, breathe the carbon dioxide using the carbon atoms as their cellular building blocks. When they are done, they exhale the oxygen. As long as there is oxygen in the atmosphere and as long as the sun produces ultraviolet light, we will always have plenty of ozone in the atmosphere. Do we really need it? The answer is yes. But not to protect us from ultraviolet light, folks. You see, ozone, O3, kills harmful bacteria <laughs> and provides a more ready form of oxygen than the common form called O2. And yes, we do need it. But it doesn't protect us from ultraviolet light at all. The only place where the so-called ozone holes occur are near the poles in the Arctic and Antarctic circles, and I thought sure everybody would see through that. What do you got? Three explosions up there? Imagine a weather station using too much damn hairspray? I mean, how come the hole is in over London? Or Los Angeles? Where they're using all of this stuff. Not wrong. I'm sorry that you feel so bad about finding out that you've been suckered, but the truth is, is I am absolutely right and you can prove it to yourself. And if you continue to yell and holler, you will have to leave this auditorium. If 
You fed up? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is like a television set, folks. If you don't like what you're hearing, turn it off. If you don't like what you're hearing, nobody has chained you to your seats. Period. I'm here to give you information. Not to kowtow to you, not to make you feel good. Let him talk first. And there will be discussion panel, so please. The only place where the so-called ozone holes occur are near the poles, folks, in the Arctic and Antarctic circles. The reason for this is that the Earth is tilted on its axis as it moves around the sun, and twice a year, one pole does not get hit with sunlight. Therefore, the reaction does not take place. And it is not a hole that is being observed, it is an absence of the reaction. There are no CFCs at the North and South Pole. There's nobody up there spraying vast amounts of CFCs from spray cans, hairspray, or anything else into the atmosphere. Period. It's not happening. It is a manipulation. And you're going to find out why in just a couple of minutes. The holes only occur, and you'll notice this, in winter at whichever point is experiencing the winter. It never occurs in the end time. They occur where the Earth's tilt causes a perpetual night during the winter months and where no ultraviolet light is coming into contact with oxygen. Thus, there is no production of ozone. Another so-called hole will predictably appear at the other polar region when that hemisphere is in its winter months. And if you'll go back to the newspaper articles which announces the poles at the hole, the holes at the poles, you will notice that wherever the hole is at the pole that it is at, it's always in the winter when that hole is not receiving sunlight. You should know by now that they are not holes at all, but only areas where the ozone producing chemical reaction between ultraviolet light and oxygen does not occur. You should have also deduced from this process that the so-called holes will seem to appear and disappear as the region moves from winter into summer and then back again into winter. The whole process is a natural cycle, it is predictable, and it's very simple to understand. The scan that CFCs deplete the ozone layer, which is non-existent, can be easily exposed. Most of the CFCs in the world can be found in the northern hemisphere, where most of the rich nations are located. Why then does a so-called hole appear over Antarctica, Antarctica, every southern hemisphere winter? Why not over New York, or Tokyo, or London, Paris, Los Angeles, or Stockholm, where the CFCs are in the most use and thus can be found in the atmosphere in the largest amounts? Is there a vacuum cleaner that immediately sucks them up and transfers them through a great hose? To the poles? I don't think so. It's because, folks, the whole thing is a hoax designed to make people who cannot think for themselves scream for total control of everything and thus help to usher in the one world totalitarian socialist government that is coming as sure as you're breathing and living and sitting in this auditorium if we don't change things. And we can. Now let's take a hard look at chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. According to the Doomsday Prophets, chlorofluorocarbon molecules are going to rise to the stratosphere, where ultraviolet light radiation will break them up, releasing chlorine molecules, which will act like a hungry cookie monster and eat all the ozone molecules. This will cause an ozone hole, and everyone will get skin cancer. Right? Wrong. Now let's look at what they don't tell you. According to measurements, only 1% of CFCs actually break up in the stratosphere. It's a heavy molecule. It's very difficult to get a molecule of CFC into the stratosphere or even near it. So that 7,500 tons of chlorine are being released into the stratosphere every year. That is for the whole atmosphere in a year's time for the whole of humanity on this earth. The amount of chlorine spewed into the atmosphere from natural sources makes that measly 7,500 tons look like a little drop in the ocean. For instance, the atmosphere absorbs 5 million tons from ocean biota, algae, plankton, etc. 84 million tons from biomass burning, 36 million tons from volcanoes, and 600 million tons from seawater. 
This does not include a volcano like Mount Pinatubo, <coughs> which loaded at least 20 million tons of chlorine into the atmosphere, of which a very significant portion went into the stratosphere. And you really believe this measly 7,500 tons is going to kill the human race, compared with the natural amount of chlorine that gets into the atmosphere? Not at all. Mount Erebus in Antarctica, which erupts every day, emits 20 times more chlorine into the atmosphere than the entire amount of chlorine allegedly produced from the breakdown of CFC. Mount Erebus is about six miles upwind from McMurdo Sand, the station from which chlorine measurements are taken. The readings are then used to claim that CFCs, not natural chlorine sources, cause the depletion of the ozone layer. It really does not matter as ozone is not layered in the atmosphere and it is not what shields us from these nasty, nasty ultraviolet lead rays. The atmosphere is constantly in motion. There's no gas layer anywhere in the atmosphere. It's evenly distributed throughout it. If gas layered in the atmosphere, you can only breathe at one elevation and no other. And the heaviest gases would be closest to the Earth, and that would be carbon dioxide. You would not be able to breathe at all in all the air. The case is exactly the same with halogens. The doomsayers want all halogen fire extinguishers banned because they produce bromine. This chemical is supposed to be a super ozone destroyer, ten times more dangerous than CFCs. The actual amount of bromine released is very insignificant, perhaps not even measurable, because most of the bromine that's actually in halogen is destroyed in a chemical reaction during fire suppression. <coughs> On top of that, they never have a life long enough in the atmosphere that is necessary to even get to the stratosphere. Ozone levels over a measured period of time shows a clear oscillation from year to year. If you were to compare the cycle of ozone levels with the number of sunspots over the same period, the correlation is very clear. An 11 year and a 22 year cycle in ozone levels matching the sunspot cycle are clearly evident. A major influence on the density of ozone in the atmosphere is sunpot, sunspots, solar flares, the influence of the sun. It is how ozone is created in the first place. Billions of tons of ozone are created every instant and are also destroyed every instant. <coughs> In 1988, the Ozone Trends Panel released a report supposedly documenting that there had been a 3% depletion in the ozone layer over the Northern Hemisphere. They gave a press conference. They handed out a summary of the report, but the report itself did not come out for another three years. When it came out, what it said was actually totally different from what they reported at the press conference, but that was buried on the last page of the newspaper. But it scared everybody, and it got everything in motion that was necessary to ban CFCs. Then they gave a whole sequence of conferences after that with the same modus operandi. They gave a press conference in April 1991 that claimed 8% ozone depletion. No scientific paper to follow it up, no peer review of the data. Last October, they gave another press conference where they claimed something very similar, but again, with no report, nothing published in the scientific literature, and no scientist on the face of this earth who would back up their report publicly. On their 1988 press conference, the Ozone Trends Panel picked a very curious date, 1969, to start their analysis of worldwide ozone data, and they ended in 1985, 17 years, or one and a half solar cycles later. If you draw a straight line from 1969 to 1985, you get the ozone depletion level that they claim. But if they had used the 22-year period between 1962 and 1985, there was no change. It's entirely a decision of what date they picked to begin their measurements, one of the most critical features of how they've been manipulating public opinion. Another way the Ozone Trends Panel manipulated their data to scare the public involves the enormous variability in the ozone in the atmosphere from day to day, month to month, and at different times of the year. Density of the ozone in the atmosphere over the northern hemisphere in March is much greater than in October of the same year. A 40% difference, and it happens every year according to the natural cycles previously described, without fail. The panel started measuring the time of year when the ozone is densest and stopped in the part of the year when it is the least dense. Again, these groups are manipulating the data intentionally to scare the public into believing there is a danger which does not actually exist. They also claim a drop-off in CFC concentrations. 
going from 100 to 5 parts per trillion in just the first 2 or 3 kilometers upon entering the stratosphere. The ozone depletion proponents say the concentrations get lower because ultraviolet radiation is breaking up the CFC molecules and the stratosphere is the only place where there are intense enough amounts of ultraviolet radiation to break down the CFC molecules. So let's look at that. The stratosphere starts around 25 kilometers above the Earth's surface and very small amounts of ultraviolet radiation in the range necessary to break down CFC molecules even get within 30 kilometers because they've already struck the oxygen molecules and it's been seriously depleted. In order to find the significant concentrations of ultraviolet radiation that can break up CFC molecules, you've got to get above 40 kilometers. CFC molecules just don't make it up that high. It's a heavy molecule, folks. So it can't be ultraviolet radiation that's getting rid of the CFCs, which is then supposed to be releasing chlorine, which is then supposed to be destroying the imaginary ozone layer. Sorry, folks, it is just not happening. Another thing they conveniently omit is that the stratosphere is an inversion layer, which means that instead of getting colder with altitude, it gets warmer. And when you have warm air on top of the cold air, the cold air is like a plug. It's why Los Angeles has its smog problem. The air cannot rise above the valley because of the inversion layer and backs up against the mountains pushed there by the ocean breezes. The air remains trapped. Whatever air makes it to the upper part of the atmosphere comes right back down because of this plug. There is no evidence that they are being broken up at all. Show me a scientific paper. Anybody, show me a paper written by a scientist that says this. They don't exist. The threat touted by the doomsayers is increased skin cancer, which is a blatant law. The only reason skin cancer has risen is that the old taboos against being in the sun, especially with the white race or light-skinned peoples, and sun tanning have fallen by the wayside. Sun tanning is a relatively modern phenomenon. The population of the world has doubled, and there are more people out in the sun and on beaches than ever in the entire history of the world. More light-skinned people have moved south or north, as the case may be, in order to enjoy milder winters. If a person living in the northern hemisphere moves south only 60 to 120 miles, it translates into an increase of 10 to 20 percent in ultraviolet radiation exposure. But if you were to move from Tromso, Norway, to Panama or Bombay, you're talking about an increase in ultraviolet radiation of more than 600 percent. And great populations have moved from the northern and southern hemisphere into the middle latitudes because of the increased affluence of people and the ability to make the travel so that they don't have to spend large sums of money to heat their homes in the winter. According to the theory of those who want to scare you into the new world order, a 1% ozone depletion means a 2% increase in ultraviolet radiation. But the data shows ultraviolet radiation actually decreased as much as 7% between 1974 and 1975 when these measurements were taken in the United States. When this study was released in Science Magazine by Joseph Scotto of the National Cancer Institute, the only network in the world systematically measuring ultraviolet radiation, the government shut down the instruments because they didn't want us to know that. CFCs are being banned, yet nobody talks about the consequence of this action. The fact is that the entire world food supply depends on what is called the cold chain. If you think people are starving now, ban CFCs. The network of refrigerated warehouses and refrigerators and homes, supermarkets, and so on that keep food from spoiling. The world already produces more than enough food to feed every man, woman, and child. The problem is that between 30 to 60 percent of it spoils every year, depending upon the country. These, effectively, you're going to have to scrap every refrigerator around the world. A billion home refrigerators, several hundred million commercial refrigerators. It could mean a collapse of the worldwide cold chain. Remember Global 2000? The plan to deplete the world's population by two billion people. To make it worse, any potential drop in substitute cannot presently be used in any existing equipment. So you've got to build entirely new equipment. And who benefits? And that's the first thing you should always ask. Who benefits? We do.
manufacturing. The multinational corporations, those who manufacture new equipment and the chemical companies that can make hundreds of billions of dollars in revenues every year from the ban of CFC. The truth is the patents of the multinational corporations on CFCs are expiring. And when they expire, anyone can make CFCs dirt cheap, not at the price that they've been charging us. They don't want to lose that money. So they cause a situation that makes us ask for a one world government, ban CFCs, we have to buy all new refrigerators, freezers, and air conditioners, and they get to sell us a new refrigerant at the same old high price. The ozone depletion theory is a fraud. There is no significant increase or decrease in ozone, no significant increase or decrease in ultraviolet radiation. The threat does not exist. It is not there. It has been proven time after time, and a group of scientists just met and arrived at the same conclusion long after my newsletter had been published and sent out to the public. It was just in the news the other day. For the first time, scientists made a decision on the ozone depletion and said that it's a hoax and that CFCs are not causing it. A nation, a world of people, that does not use its intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All the speakers, please come up and we will have the panel. Now you may ask your questions.